Yeah, so welcome to this introductory course in biostatistics and bioinformatics. So my name is uh, David Fenio and I'll be giving some of the lectures uh, in this course and uh, also Stuart Brown over there he will be giving some other some other parts of the, uh, the class uh, and also there's a third lecture Judy Zhang who you will meet uh, in probably next week I think um, and also uh, so this class it will be lectures on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. almost always in this room but there are some exceptions uh, but uh, on Tuesdays after the lecture, uh, Pamela Wu, who you probably most of you know, will uh, give a tutorial in uh, uh, in Python programming, uh, and uh, that and she'll also help you to do uh, get started on the homework. Um, and uh, so, if you think you will need some uh, extra help. Uh, definitely come and talk to me and we can organize uh, a tutor for you. Um, yeah, so, so today I'm going to quickly go through the whole course uh, in the first half and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, different ways that one can uh, explore uh, data. So, um, oh yeah, so, so yeah, as I said, so lectures are Tuesdays and Thursdays. So, uh, uh, and the tutorials are right following the lecture on Tuesdays. And there is an extra tutorial this Saturday uh, at 3 p.m., also in this room. Um, then, so the location is almost always here except twice, October 23rd and December uh, 2nd. And then it's in the, the Skirball third floor uh, seminar room instead. Uh, and there is a website uh, that you can uh, uh, look all the information. So here is where we will uh, update if there is new information. Uh, so you can, for example, uh, download the slides from today's lecture. And then for uh, Pamela's tutorial, there are a few documents uh, that you will use that you can also download from there. Uh, then there is also uh, uh, reading uh, uh, material that uh, we provide here. Uh, and uh, also, so when there is, uh, for example, this, since this is on Saturday, it's been marked in red. And also the, when the lecture is in Skirball, we've uh, highlighted that in red on the website. So always check there. Uh, that's where we, if there are any changes. So uh, this lecture, so now I'm going to start, just go through the whole course quickly. Uh, and so you get an overview of um, everything that we're going to talk about. So this first lecture is about exploring data. So it will be looking at small data sets, how to best visualize them, and then going to, to very large uh, data sets. So this example is uh, uh, seven different uh, samples uh, that uh, are, uh, uh, were analyzed with proteomics, and then it just shows how the different samples correlate with each other. So the second lecture, so, so the first lecture will only be uh, displaying data in different ways. So the, it's only in the second lecture where we start to do some calculations on the data. Uh, like uh, we will uh, uh, calculate uh, uh, point estimates like uh, uh, mean and variance. Uh, and we will uh, then also use these to go back and visualize the data in different ways. So for example, this figure shows how one can use uh, a box plot to visualize a lot of information in a very compact way. So here, what we have is, we have 20 different measurements, these circles up here. Uh, so uh, what the, in the box plot, what we show as a line here is the median of the data. And uh, the reason to show the median here is that uh, if we have uh, skewed data, which it's not unusual that we have, it will be a much more robust measure. And then as a uh, measure of the variance, we show the interquartile range. 
so the uh, we show a box that encompasses half the data points uh, and then we show the error bars uh, as uh, uh, one and a half times the interquartile range uh, and then one can also uh, put a notch here on the uh, on the box to uh, uh, to show what the 95% uh, confidence interval is but we will go uh, into much more detail on the next lecture about these things uh, the third lecture which uh, uh, Stuart is going to give will be about different data tapes and representations in molecular biology and there are a lot of them uh, there are many, many different ways to represent uh, data. There are a few representations that are more common than others. So you'll, you'll learn about uh, the FASTA file, which uh, is a, a sequence, uh, represents sequences. So you have a header line for each sequence, which uh, has an identifier and then a description, followed by several lines uh, with the sequence. And then you can have repeated blocks like this throughout. Uh, so this is just gives you information about the sequence. Then the FASTQ file is, uh, the Q stands for quality. So that has, in addition to the sequence, it also has uh, a compact way to show the quality of the uh, of the data. Uh, so each so uh, each uh, base pair uh, base in this case has a quality measure associated with it. Uh, and then there are uh, other uh, formats to describe, uh, for example, uh, uh, protein mappings to the genome and other uh, features that are mapped to the genome and. Uh, GFF3 is one other format. But as you'll see, there are many, many more formats, and uh, uh, there is always a lot of uh, uh, work that is involved in converting between uh, different types of formats. So lecture four will be uh, given by uh, Judy Zhang. So she is uh, in the Division of Biostatistics in the Department of Population Health. And she will uh, lead you through uh, uh, statistics and starting with the uh, probability. Uh, so as you probably all know, I mean, probability is uh, a number between zero and one that one usually represents that uh, something that's certain and uh, zero is something that will never happen. Uh, so, uh, and uh, there are uh, also different ways you will learn about how, uh, if you have two uh, events, how to combine the probabilities of these events. If they're independent uh, events, you can simply multiply the two probabilities. If they are not, then it, uh, uh, you, it's more uh, complicated than that. You learn about conditional probabilities. Uh, if, uh, so, so if, what's the probability of an event happening if another uh, event has happened in the past? Uh, and uh, you'll also learn about uh, Bayes' rule, uh, which is very useful in a lot of different contexts later. So then there will be two lectures on sequence alignment. So this is a very uh, commonly done in bioinformatics, is that you have two sequences of, for example, two nucleotide sequences, two protein sequences, um, and you want to uh, find the best alignment between them, allowing for both uh, insertions and deletions. Uh, and uh, there, uh, there are uh, several very uh, good methods to do this. Uh, well, and this is something that, again, uh, Stuart is going to lead you through in more detail. Uh, so then lecture seven will going back to statistics and talk about different kinds of distributions. So the, the most common distribution will be that we'll discuss is the normal distribution and you learn about its uh, properties and uh, what and and how what the mean and uh, standard deviation and so means for for that distribution. But if you don't have a normal distribution, you can still, with a, if you have a, uh, take a sample, you can still calculate 
uh, mean an uh, uh, variance, but it will mean uh, something very different depending on what your distribution is. Then uh, an extension of sequence alignment is to search a database with a sequence. So here we have one sequence that we then compare uh, sequentially to a lot of different uh, sequences, a whole database of sequences. And uh, here you, you probably heard about one of the most popular ways to do this is to use BLAST. And uh, you probably have come across that already, but uh, uh, Stuart is going to tell you more in detail about uh, uh, what, what, how you should interpret the results and what, it, uh, what uh, the uh, expectation value means in this case and how, uh, whether, and, and how to look at the sequence alignments. So uh, experimental design is very important uh, and it's very easy to get it very wrong uh, and uh, it's very easy to c bring up examples where it uh, really goes wrong uh, but uh, and I have come across many cases with people that have done some very bad experiments. So uh, I'll try to uh, uh, go through about how to do good experimental design and also give some examples of when it really went wrong. And it goes, and it's, uh, it's always surprising, it's easy to laugh about it afterwards, but uh, still good scientists over and over uh, do uh, bad experimental designs. It's not at all unusual. So, so it's definitely worth spending a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, so uh, proteomics informatics, so this is uh, uh, going to be about mass spectrometry based proteomics. So what, um, what we do there is we take our samples and uh, extract the proteins, digest the proteins and uh, finally separate, uh, make peptides that are uh, reasonable size for mass spectrometry and then uh, analyze, uh, separate them and analyze uh, mass spectrometry. So we, what we do in mass spectrometry, we measure mass to charge. Uh, so usually we plot uh, the, uh, the spectrum as mass to charge on the x-axis and the intensity of the peaks on the y-axis. And the mass to charge nowadays can be measured really accurately. And we use that to identify uh, the, uh, the proteins. Uh, and then we use, oops, then we use the uh, intensity to quantify them. And uh, we'll go into uh, detail how, to, how this uh, is done. So then, uh, both with the... Uh, with microarrays, proteomics, uh, with uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, different types of experiments, you can get uh, information either about gene expression or what the protein concentration is. And uh, the, uh, it's, it's, people have worked a lot on how to uh, analyze this, how to normalize it, so, because you, uh, from experiment to experiment, you get variations, but you can uh, apply different normalization methods and different analysis methods. This is something that, again, Stuart is going to uh, tell you more in detail about. Uh, then we're back to more statistics. So estimation. So instead, one important thing is uh, how to from a measurement, how do we estimate uh, the different parameters? So uh, there are, we can either do a point estimate. So in this case, this shows just the, would be the average, uh, would be the point estimate, but also other point estimates are the variance uh, uh, or the uh, skewness of the uh, curve. And then uh, in estimation, we both estimate uh, uh, let's say the mean, but we also want to uh, estimate the interval. So we want to get uh, a confidence interval. And this is, uh, there will be two lectures on this uh, by Judy Zhang uh, to uh, how this is uh, uh, best done. Then again, more uh, on uh, sequences. Uh, so we, we earlier, 
you uh, had uh, lectures about uh, uh, aligning two sequences and also searching databases with a sequence. But here now there will be uh, how to align multiple sequences. And this is a, uh, has its uh, uh, additional complexity when you have several proteins. So in this case, it's a, a case seen from several different uh, animals. And uh, it, uh, it is one region uh, that we see here where uh, the one part here, we have a very uh, uh, good alignment for the different animals, but other parts there is less alignment, but there's still some residues that are uh, very well conserved. And then uh, the other thing, so the, uh, that in statistics that you'll have a lot of use for is hypothesis testing. So this is just an example of someone who makes a hypothesis, thinks, uh, says that the median age of the population is 50, and then you take a sample, and it turns out that the uh, average uh, age is 25. So then you reject the hypothesis. Um, so this is the basis for hypothesis testing, but um, you'll, there will be two full lectures on this giving you a lot of details and a lot of practice on how, how to do this best. Um, again, so we're back to sequence analysis and now looking at sequence motifs. So uh, here we've taken out uh, a reasonably well-conserved uh, region and we want to look at exactly which uh, uh, bases are conserved and which are not. And there is uh, a, you can, one way that often this is done, which is very illustrative, is uh, showing a, a sequence logo of this region. Uh, so, uh, and it shows the information. So, for example, when the letters are large, uh, it's really dominated by uh, one, uh, uh, one base in those positions. But here, there's quite a bit of ambiguity. And then there are other places where it's dominated by one base, but it's really not, but uh, quite often there are other possibilities also. So then another thing that you can use sequences for is to uh, create different phylogenies. Uh, so this is of course based on that uh, uh, evolutionary uh, uh, there is, was a common ancestor that would uh, then, then uh, in different species, the, uh, the sequences diverged. And so you can, by looking at how similar sequences are uh, over uh, different species, you can uh, draw these phylogenies. Uh, then back to statistics, so ANOVA, which is a uh, uh, sort of more generalization of the t-test. Uh, with, uh, applying to many different, uh, uh, when you have many different groups, uh, then uh, categorical data methods. So when you have different uh, uh, categories and uh, you want to see whether there is any correlation between these categories, uh, then uh, you, you will learn about how to apply those methods. Uh, and then uh, regression and correlation. So that's a very common thing that you will come across uh, when you do experiments is that you want to uh, correlate different measurements uh, and see whether there is uh, any, uh, uh, any correlation between them. Uh, and then finally, uh, non-parametric methods. Uh, so, usually what we'll, throughout most of uh, the, the statistics discussions, we will apply, uh, assume that uh, our population is normally distributed. But this is not always the case, and so you will learn about what to, how to deal with that, uh, the case when you don't know the distribution and you, you can't uh, uh, assume that it's a certain distribution. So then, 24th lecture will be on signal processing. So uh, it will be about the case when you can represent your measurements as uh, a 
no as noise and then you have a few peaks so in this case we we can probably see that there are three peaks but this last one is a little bit difficult to discern because it's very close to the noise so it uh, it, what you learn is a general strategy how you can, uh, from a measurement like this, how you can uh, characterize and find uh, uh, and separate the signal from the noise. So uh, uh, the uh, so first you what you need to do is to you need to know the properties and the distributions of both your signal and the noise, and then you can make a model of this uh, and. Uh, then pick one detection method and we'll, we'll, we'll go through a few different ways that you can uh, use the, do the detection. And then you can do, since you have modeled the data and modeled both the uh, signal and noise, you can then simulate uh, to, to test which, where, how to set the, uh, the thresholds and the parameters. Then we'll learn a little bit about bioimage analysis. Uh, and that is uh, how to uh, take a microscopy image and um, uh, extract information from it. Uh, and not just by looking at it, but uh, uh, automating this analysis and uh, 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 to, to, to be able to look at much, uh, get much better statistics and look at many more uh, images. So then next generation sequencing will be uh, covered in one lecture and this is probably most of you during your PhD will probably get in con will probably be generating next generation sequencing data in your project so this is a, uh, will give you an overview of what kind of things uh, one can do with that how one can use it for uh, confirming uh, genes or finding new genes or finding uh, variants uh, and so that's also another uh, lecture that uh, Stuart will uh, give. Then uh, there will be a lecture on machine learning and uh, uh, basically what machine learning is that you make many measurements on uh, uh, let's say you make a, a proteomics measurement where you measure thousands of different proteins uh, and you want to separate two cases, let's say, uh, disease from healthy. And uh, so you want to, in this multidimensional space, uh, you want to be able to find uh, a, uh, a separation between your, uh, your two cases. So in this case, in the two-dimensional case, it would, we would draw a line to try to separate uh, the blue squares from the red uh, circles. And then, finally, the last lecture will be on modeling and simulation. Uh, so often it is uh, very good when you have a, a, a complex experimental data to try to think of a model uh, that uh, captures the essence of what you think is going on and then use computer simulations to uh, generate uh, the, uh, uh, the under the same conditions as your experiment and then compare these simulations with the experiments to see if you can better understand your uh, your experimental data in this way and this is a very can be very powerful and one can be going to go through a, f a few really simple models uh, so this, uh, the figure here just shows an, a, a time-resolved chip-chip experiment for uh, uh, replication fork progression in yeast. So uh, you see, uh, so it's time uh, going down here, starting, this is before S phase, there's nothing much going on. Uh, when it enters S phase, you have some binding to the uh, origins of replication. Uh, and then you have movement of the forks out and finally it's uh, over. So this just shows in uh, five different uh, regions uh, what, what's happening both in the experiment and in the a very simple uh, simulation model. So this was uh, just the overview of the course and uh, then
Uh, now I'm going to talk about how a little bit exploration of data. Any questions on this part? Okay. So uh, exploring data. So we'll start out. Oh, um, in there is a uh, data visualization blog uh, that uh, Nature Methods has put together. That's definitely worth um, uh, looking at. It starts out with some very basic things like uh, uh, how to choose colors and how to uh, general layout of presentations uh, and uh, goes into some quite detailed, uh, uh, I mean detailed uh, uh, visualization methods. So that's, I definitely recommend uh, reading those. These are usually very short articles, uh, but, but there's quite a lot of them. But uh, it's definitely worth, because data visualization is, it, it comes naturally to some people, but for most of us it doesn't. But one, one can definitely work on it to, to improve it, uh, because uh, it's, it's definitely a, uh, important to, to do it, try to do it well at least. So here I've just taken a simple example data set with uh, 20 measurements and this is the order that they were measured and I've just simply as a first step plotted each point in the order that they were measured. So we see we have a little bit of a scatter so uh, but it looks uh, rather random and it looks like it's centered somewhere around zero here. Uh, so this is a very good way to initially approach a measurement because if something systematic happens, if you this is a measurement of the same uh, quantity. So it shouldn't be anything uh, systematic that uh, after half the measurements there is a big jump or something like that. Uh, but this is probably the a very simple and, uh, way to see if something really went wrong during the time that uh, the measurements were done. Um, so one way to then summarize it, because we don't, from just looking at these points, it's a little bit difficult to see what the distribution is. What we can do is we can make a histogram. So now uh, this is shows uh, how many of the points were, uh, how far they deviated from zero. And so now we see that if we have, depending on what bin size we choose, here we have just uh, five different bins that we put it in. And uh, we, we just count how many are uh, in, these, uh, in this area. Uh, so then we can, of course, change the bin size and unfortunately for, for histograms, which is a little, it's quite critical how you choose the bin size. Um, and that's why they're not uh, always the best way to do it. Especially if you have many points, it doesn't matter. You can get a uh, very nice histogram. But with few points, it's really, and, and 20 points is really too few, as you see, to really uh, do a good. I mean, here we get a reasonable, histogram but it, it's really uh, a little bit too the bins are too wide so we don't get a good feeling for uh, what the data looks like so there is another way to do this and that's called the kernel density estimate so now what we what we do is uh, at each point here so we put each point down here uh, and then we put a small uh, curve around it, like a small uh, Gaussian distribution, for example. You can use other things also. And then you do that for each point and you add them up. And in this uh, way, you get, first of all, you get a smooth curve. Uh, so you, you don't have uh, the problem of uh, that uh, you have uh, these uh, discrete jumps. Uh, so it will be, so later on you'll see when we compare two different measurements it's much easier to see differences when you um, have a, a kernel density estimate 
And you'll learn uh, later in the, uh, in the Python tutorials how to do this very uh, easily. There are built-in functions to do both the histogram and these kernel density estimates. Uh, so uh, actually, so what I, these, the data was actually picked uh, randomly from a normal distribution. So the red curve shows what the original distribution was that it was picked from. And you see that uh, we can, with the kernel density estimate, we can reconstitute the original distribution reasonably well. Not perfect, it's only 20 points, but uh, still. But with the histogram, we get these uh, 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 discrete uh, jumps. So if you have more data, now we have 200 uh, data points. Uh, we see that now uh, the histogram is starting to work better, and we can. Uh, uh, but again, we have to very carefully choose what width uh, to, to use when do, making the histogram. And, but the kernel density the estimate, again, will still be uh, reasonably good. So this is, again, comparing to the uh, original distribution. <coughs> so now, let's say we want to compare different measurements. So here we have five different measurements. Uh, on the uh, left side here, we have uh, uh, done 20 measurements for each of these values, and here it's 200. And then if we now show all the uh, points here, we can see reasonably well what's uh, uh, going on. There, uh, for the, when we have 20 points, we see that there's probably no difference between the two first ones. The third one is maybe a little bit higher, then this is the highest, and this is somewhere in between. And uh, then that becomes very clear when we go to have 200 points. But then if we now instead compare uh, either histograms or uh, kernel density estimates. So this is the uh, histogram that corresponds to uh, this first uh, 20 uh, data sets. And then we're going to add on the other one. So this is, and that's the kernel density estimate for this uh, data uh, set. And again, this uh, uh, histogram here corresponds to that, and then the corresponding kernel density estimate. So now when we add, go to add on the second data set, uh, we see that both uh, from the histogram, it's rather difficult to see in this case what's happening, but it looks pretty similar. But when we do the kernel estimate, we, uh, we see much clearer what's exactly happening. And uh, now, remember, this lecture, we're only displaying data. We are not uh, at all uh, doing any calculations, so we're not going to be able to tell whether two measurements are different. That uh, only comes uh, next time. So then if we add on the third one, we see that from uh, this histogram, we really can't tell what's happening. But now we see a little shift in here. And then when we have many data points, we also sh see the shift in the, uh, for the, uh, the histogram, but clearer for the kernel density estimate. And then now, when we go to this data set here, we see that it's, there's a big jump. Uh, so it's almost completely separated, uh, this uh, distribution from the uh, previous three. And then, again, when we, the last one will fall in between here. So again, it's a uh, very, what I recommend when comparing uh, different data sets is that if one has few data points, it's good to just show all the data points. That's uh, probably the best thing to do. And also, if you have, in some cases, very few data points in a, and other measurements have very many, it's good to show uh, then also and so that the reader can easily see that there is a big uh, uh, discrepancy in, different, uh, in the number of uh, measurements. 
So there's one more way. So we talked about histograms and uh, kernel density estimates. But uh, the third way that we can uh, compare measurements is uh, the uh, cumulative distributions. So uh, here now, what we do is uh, we start uh, at uh, uh, much lower uh, point than any data point. And here uh, we set that to zero. And then as soon as we reach one data point, we take a step uh, and then so on. So what we, and then we end up, uh, as we pass through all the data points, we end up to one. And this is also very clear, much clearer way to show differences when you have very few uh, data points. Uh, so again, if we now, so this curve is for this data set here. So we can then go through to the next one, number two, which uh, almost uh, uh, completely is identical to that. Uh, and then the third one, which is a slight shift. Uh, the fourth one has a big shift. And then the last one is in between. So these are three different ways that we can uh, quite easily compare data. Now. What I mentioned before is that we uh, sometimes strange things happen during measurements. And these are a few examples of that. Uh, in the, when we only do a few measurements, it's a little bit difficult to see. Uh, but what we see in several cases, this seems to be, so now, yeah, I should probably mention that what I've done here is still, like in the beginning, plotted the d data points in the order they were acquired. Uh, to see if there is anything. So here, what we see is that there seems to be a correlation between uh, the order that they were acquired and uh, the, but we can't see very clearly what the correlation is. Here, one can see much clearer that uh, these cases, it's probably a linear drift in the two, uh, high, in four and five. Here, there's a big jump uh, at, uh, uh, in the middle of the measurement. And here there is, seems to be a jump towards the end. But this one looks uh, good, more, it's a randomly distributed over the whole, uh, over the time that we measured. Uh, so in this case, it's much easier to see these kinds of systematic problems from uh, uh, showing all the data points as a function of uh, how they were acquired. Because uh, if we look at uh, the uh, either the kernel density estimates or the cumulative distribution functions here, uh, we won't see it as clearly. Uh, for example, here we see a little uh, uh, shoulder, but it's not, uh, it's much clearer here what, uh, what's happening that it's at the end of the measurement, something, uh, there was a shift. Uh, again, here, in this case, we, we see that um, the, there's a bimodal distribution because we have really two different measurements. There was a big jump. Uh, but then when we look at these linear drifts, there is really no way to tell from the uh, no easy way to tell from the kernel, either the kernel density estimate and or the uh, cumulative distribution function that something has happened to the measurement. So uh, definitely remember to, even though these plots uh, of showing all the data points in the order that they were uh, obtained is are usually not so exciting. And that's the point. They shouldn't be exciting. They should be really boring and look random. So then how to show different data. So the linear data is easy. So here we have a, a, a linear relationship. And then at low values, we don't have uh, any, we have some kind of threshold. So we can't measure below a certain level. So now we, we have done a few measurements on each here uh, and shown them as black filled circles. But that's not ideal because they overlap and it's difficult to tell how many points there are. So what we can do is we can, uh, it's much better to use uh, uh, circles that are not filled. 
uh, here now we can uh, usually see how many data points we have uh, much better than in this case uh, but even better especially if you have the x-axis is categorical so it's different categories what we can add is a little bit of jitter and maybe show them in different colors uh, and now we really can see uh, all the, uh, the data points. So if we have an exponential function uh, that we should not show on a linear scale. It would uh, in this case it would look like this we just see the uh, the highest data points and everything else gets squished down here so that's and but we can simply take the log of that to uh, uh, the log of the y-axis if we have such uh, an exponential relationship and then we again can see the data uh, uh, properly and uh, definitely the you should think a lot about how to uh, be how you can transform your data so that uh, all the data you can see as much of the data uh, as possible in one uh, plot and these are some simple examples but you're probably uh, gonna run into other cases with your own data where it's not that straightforward so uh, then if you have a power function again in a linear scale uh, it's not you can sort of see what's going on but it's not uh, as uh, informative as if you take uh, both do uh, show both axes on a log scale because then you can see again that you have this uh, uh, linear relationship uh, but then it falls off uh, and there is a threshold which you couldn't tell uh, here because it was too small. So then if we want to illustrate correlation between two variables uh, we would uh, show them as one variable on one axis and the other variable on the other axis. So this just shows this uh, drawn from the same distribution this is uh, 20 points 200 points and more and more points uh, and as you can see uh, it if you show it like this it becomes uh, uh, they overlay on each other and you can't see really see structure in when you have really many points so one simple way that you can uh, avoid that is to make these slightly transparent uh, so that uh, it would uh, so this is the same data set shown with different levels of transparency so you just uh, told the, uh, the program to to make each of these a little bit transparent and then you can see the uh, the structure much better uh, than you could before and alternatives to this would be then to uh, so here we have the uh, all the data points shown in the same color uh, without transparency and with a lot of transparency or you can show it as a, a 2D histogram as a, a, a with a, a color scale on how many points there are in these areas or you can also show it as a 3D graph uh, but this is really not recommended and uh, usually they look they can look very pretty but usually they're quite useless so here's another example when there is a little bit more structure to this uh, data so if we just add a little bit of transparency we don't see anything different but if we add more transparency we see that there is a feature here uh, that's uh, separate from uh, the, uh, the other distribution and then if we show this as a, this is the case the regular the first case we looked at and here is this other feature that we can see uh, pretty well on the uh, on the 2d histogram and actually in this case even the 3D plot since if we select the right angle we can see that uh, extra feature there pretty well so now 
this is a, a proteomics data set that just two samples that are compared and uh, what we uh, show so first we show it on a linear scale uh, so these are the uh, is a spectrum count which is a way to quantitate uh, it's, it's a, a simple way to quantitate uh, proteomics data uh, so the two samples uh, there seems to be some correlation but the showing it on a linear scale is not uh, so good as showing it on a log scale so uh, now we've simply taken the log 2 of the spectral count and then we can see much more uh, features uh, so uh, uh, what we see is that uh, there are uh, since this is uh, spectral counting we see this discrete uh, uh, nature of the uh, of uh, the uh, the process. So, uh, and then we see that there's quite a good correlation, and there are outliers. Uh, but if you, it's probably not so clear. But if you look here, there is actually a lot of uh, measurements that are not a lot of proteins that are not found in one of the uh, samples but on, but only in the other one and vice versa but those since we take uh, those will be zero in one case so they they will not show up here but we could add them back into an arbitrary place and uh, so here we've just added them back uh, at uh, zero so we can so these are uh, measurements that are not present in one sample but uh, uh, present in the other one so this is a way to uh, to give you it gives a little bit more information also about and I observe that here we're also using the transparency so to uh, because it's uh, quite crowded uh, so then we can do it some other way so here we have shown one uh, spectrum count against the other but uh, what we can instead take the log 2 ratio on the x-axis for example and we can sum the spectrum count so take the average on the y-axis and then again put back the uh, the ones that are only present in one sample at an arbitrary position uh, and then because uh, this is would be easier than to uh, see which ones are really outliers here or we can uh, this can be shown as a histogram that will also give us uh, uh, an idea so here we probably can see that there's quite a lot of proteins that are only present in uh, one of the samples here and less that are unique to the other sample but here we very clearly see uh, can quantitate how many are there so this is two samples then we have another uh, example with seven samples and three replicates so the one thing that we want to make sure if we have measured so many uh, uh, data sets this uh, so these are uh, proteomics measurements so they each take a few hours to measure so it uh, it might uh, take uh, a few days to measure something like this and we want to see that it doesn't things don't change during these measurements dramatically so what we can do is to just make again a kernel density estimate of uh, the distribution what the intensities of our measurements are so here we have uh, shown all the so these are uh, uh, 21 3 times 7 uh, curves and we show that they're reasonably well but if we uh, normalize it we can get uh, a better correspondence uh, but then in another case we measure these three replicates so that's the same but then a uh, few months later we added another replicate which was uh, a, a little bit off here but then with normalization we can get it uh, back uh, and we can then compare how we uh, uh, I mean we can then compare the data sets better so then this is the same uh, seven samples so here now after doing the normalization we uh, show the different uh, samples so these seven samples here and we compare them to each other so it's actually symmetrical around the diagonal and we we see how well 
some of them correlate really well. And here we've also added in the correlation coefficient. We, also, we still ha show the uh, proteins that are only in one sample. And then we can see that sometimes we get a really good correlation and other times we have uh, much more of a spread uh, difference between the samples. But this is a very nice way to get uh, a lot of data into one place and uh, to that one can clearly see what's going on. And then we can, of course, do the same transformation as we did before to show instead the ratio. Uh, and then we can uh, look for outliers that are shown in red here. Another useful way to show, give very large overview of data sets is Venn diagrams. Uh, and this, is, uh, this can show uh, some very, uh, very high level information of what's happening. Uh, but it's usually worth paying a little bit attention to how you do the Venn diagrams so that it doesn't, if you use generate them automatically, they become usually very boring and uh, not so useful. But in this case, we can uh, very clearly see that uh, some feature, like for example, uh, the, the variants that we detect in uh, RNA are much more than what we can detect in the, on the protein level. But uh, more than half of the ones that are detected on the protein level, we can't detect on the RNA. So we can give, uh, by designing the Venn diagram the right way, we can uh, point uh, the readers to, uh, to see the, uh, the interesting parts very well. Uh, then, of course, you can do some very uh, quite complex uh, uh, visualization like um, uh, in this case, showing uh, unsupervised clustering uh, based on gene expression data. Uh, and then it has been uh, decorated with all sorts of other uh, information below. Uh, and so this is a, an example of a very complicated uh, uh, visualization that you'll, by the end of this course, you'll be able to do things like this very easily. Uh, so, uh, another few examples of looking at going from very detailed information uh, to very large overviews. So, in this case, we looked at correlations in the, between individual samples. So, this shows the correlation. Uh, this is uh, uh, proteomics colon data, 95, from 95 samples and uh, showing the correlation between uh, 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 mRNA and a protein. And uh, there is, it's usually a positive correlation, uh, but it's uh, the, the, the mean of the, cor uh, of the distribution is only 0 0.23. Uh, and this is very uh, common that one sees quite limited correlation between uh, protein concentration and gene expression in, uh, in during, I mean, through in a lot of different sample types. Uh, so, uh, but another way to look at this would be to uh, now, in this case, we're looking at uh, copy number variation. So uh, here is the different chromosomes. So on the x-axis is the copy number uh, where it is, and then it's uh, looking at what genes it affects. So now what we've done is for this 95 colon samples calculated uh, for each uh, location uh, what the correlation coefficient is between uh, the uh, be, between uh, copy number variation and gene and gene expression. Uh, and here it's for the same figure for uh, copy number versus uh, uh, protein concentration. So what we see here is that we have these uh, cis effects. So if the copy number changes locally, it will affect gene expression, which is not so surprising. But what we see, there are some 
things that are called trans hubs that, uh, for example, if uh, the copy number changes here, it affects uh, genes over the whole, uh, over all the chromosomes. And there are several of these. And the same uh, on the, the protein level. So this is, uh, here we have taken uh, a lot of data and condensed it in a way that uh, it's, uh, we can easily see very large effects. Uh, so again, going from very detailed, so this is just uh, aligning uh, sequences to a genome to illustrate that uh, at this location uh, there is a variant. Uh, so it's a T instead of the, the references down here, it's a G. Uh, and so this is very detailed information. And also it gives us a little bit feeling for how much the uh, error rate is. So here there are some... Uh, uh, sort of lonely uh, mismatches, but these are probably just uh, um, uh, errors in the sequencing. So then if we go a little bit uh, higher level, so this is chip chip data from uh, Trypanosoma brucei uh, showing what the distribution is of uh, histone H4 uh, through the genome and histone H4 that acetylated that lies in 10. And uh, uh, then uh, what we can see very clearly in this case is that, uh, histone, that uh, histone H4 that's acetylated that lies in uh, 10 as a, yeah, uh, is very much enriched at uh, the start of these polycystronic uh, uh, transcription units. Uh, so this is one level up. So then we can go even another level up showing uh, genomic rearrangements. Uh, so here we have in the circular way we show all the chromosomes and these uh, lines show if there is a crossover in the, that we've detected in our sequencing data. So, so these are now, this is now a very high level uh, uh, illustration of what's uh, going on. Uh, then Another thing uh, that we become more and more interested in is interactive visualizations. Uh, and because we have this uh, enormous complexity of the data, but we really want to be able to jump between different levels. D just the same way as in Google Maps, you want to be able to zoom in and out and to see things. Uh, ideally, we want to do that for uh, both genomics and proteomics and very easily. And uh, so nowadays, the, the uh, web browsers have become uh, very powerful. So you can actually do a lot of this in the web browser. Uh, and uh, so uh, this just shows one example of where you can look at uh, different uh, uh, clinical uh, data so this down here is proteomics and then uh, looking at uh, different stages of uh, colon cancer, uh, different uh, parts of the colon, and then the same for the uh, gene expression data in this. And then we have the, uh, uh, up here, the, uh, the protein sequences and then the DNA. So what we, uh, but uh, traditionally, so the, uh, the genome browsers show this in a genome-centric view. So what, but the problem is that we're interested usually in what happens in the exons. But uh, usually exons are small and introns are big. So it doesn't really illustrate. So what one can do, so this application lets you uh, switch back and forth and uh, uh, just go down and, for example, remove all the introns at, uh, just with one click. Or maybe even better, not remove them, but shrink them and uh, sort of just transform the space so that uh, it enhances the information in the, uh, in the exons, but still keeps some summary information in the introns. Uh, and then we can even uh, uh, scale it uh, more so that uh, showing the parts that we were interested in. And then in this case, since we, uh, we're interested in uh, proteomics data, 
actually what we can let each of these is a peptide uh, that uh, has some evidence in mass spectrometry so what we can do is we can click uh, on on the peptide uh, to then uh, see the mass spectrometric evidence for that peptide and we can and this also can be brought up uh, uh, into the browser uh, very uh, easily uh, so we can go back and analyze these enormous amounts of data and choose the level of uh, complex i mean the, the level uh, of detail that we want to see uh, so uh, this is just some more uh, details and i'm going to skip that so that brings us to the end of this uh, lecture so uh, what I've shown you a little bit of how one can, starting from very simple data sets, how one can uh, look at, start investigating them, both using scatter plots, histograms, or uh, kernel density estimates, how one can then compare these uh, measurements uh, uh, do you, using different, also the, uh, these methods. Uh, and then we also looked at a little bit at how to illustrate correlation best and then a few examples of uh, other more uh, complex visualization <laughs> and next uh, uh, lecture which will be on thursday at uh, uh, 2 p.m we'll look a little bit more at how one can uh, do calculate uh, different uh, estimates of the uh, of these uh, of measurements so uh, i will stop there and uh, take any questions so pam will take over now and she will uh, answer all everything